Well, hello and welcome YouTube, Mr. Robinson back here with yet another brand new exciting video, all math based of course, and as always, it is an honor and a privilege to be serving you today, as it is every day here in my virtual classroom. If you step on inside and we are reviewing all of chapter 6 in the Big Ideas Math Integrated Math 2 textbook, this is from a worksheet though, not from the textbook. You can check out this PDF down below and see what kinds of things correspond to things that you've been learning. This is made from one of my colleagues and not myself. I'm running through it for the first time. But go and print that one out if you want to follow along or just watch along if you want to learn some things. I will be doing the review from the textbook itself, that actual one. You'll see a video come up with that at some point, as well as the chapter six test and cumulative review, I believe it's called. So look out for those ones for that official playlist bit. I'll give you a link to the whole IM2 playlist so you can find all those other ones in chapter six. This chapter six thing is relationships with triangles and hopefully I can call out the sections if I remember to as we do each problem as I remember them we'll see I do not believe this review will cover section six seven but we'll see what shows up so get ready get it printed out pause this thing if you need to otherwise let's go ahead and get started as you can see this is clearly a worksheet it's like a homework assignment thing so I mean you know it starts off with are you ready so guys are you ready? Are you ready? Let's do it. <laughs> Let's go ahead and get started here. Let's look at problem number one, given AD equals DC. So those are lengths of segments, these guys. It is shown and marked. And AC is perpendicular to DB. So it's more of, we probably have these segments here. Segment AC is perpendicular to segment DB, also shown with a marking of a right angle. Let me move myself here this way. Here I go. Whoop. Okay, great. Let's answer these questions. Write the equation set up. Okay. Um, I don't know if we're solving. Oh, I guess we solve on part C. So write the equation set up. So what we're doing here, this is I believe out of section 6-2. It's called the perpendicular bisector theorem. And it states this. When a segment such as AC is perpendicularly bisected. And that's what BD is doing. It's intersecting with it perpendicularly, but because D is at the midpoint of AC as they're congruent in equal lengths, that means BD is also a bisector. So BD, a perpendicular bisector BC. When a segment is perpendicularly bisected, any point on the perpendicular bisector, such as B or such as D, is equidistant from the endpoints of that segment. So these two lengths are also going to be equal. I'm going to mark them with congruent segments right here, but the equation that we can set up is 5x plus 17 equals 8x minus 37. I'll probably use blue here. Give me one second to do that. This is known as the perpendicular bisector theorem. The perpendicular bisector theorem. Now it can be proven, all that stuff. And furthermore, it is going to be used in future things that we do involving circumcenters. Hopefully I can call that out when we're doing that stuff later, but this is the perpendicular bisector theorem. Now they state solve for x, this is basic algebra from here, I'm not going to be spending long teaching that. From this equation guys, I'm going to subtract 5x from both sides and I'll get 3x on the right. If I add 37 to both sides, I get 54. Divide both sides by 3, you get x equals 18. So x is 18, like so, and it says solve for bc. BC, and now listen, you can substitute 18 into either expression. The idea is they're equal. You might as well even double check by plugging both in. Uh, eight plus, I don't know, eight times 18. Um, 144, I'm, I'm gonna see if this is right. I don't have a calculator with me, but eight times 18 minus 37. I'm gonna guess 144 minus 37. We'll see, because I'm getting 107 from that. Here's my double check on that. Let's substitute it also into AB. It should be the same length. And I do know 5 times 18 is 90, plus 17. That is indeed 107. So they're the same length. That kind of helps confirm that what you solved for with x is correct. And they're equal in length for a reason. That theorem came into play. So that's number one. Number two says, given that angle ABD is congruent to angle DBC. You see those congruent marks there. That does mean these are the same length, which will mean something about this segment BD right here. We'll get into it as well. well I guess we got to get into it right now. Um, so we have what's called an angle bisector in BD. This angle ABC was bisected by this segment right here because this is going right down the middle. We know that because these are two congruent parts. BD is an angle bisector, and D is perpendicular to BA and to BC. 
The perpendicularity aspect isn't really what we're look seeking for, but the fact that it's perpendicular means this is the shortest distance to both of those sides. You guys may understand that the shortest distance from a point to a line is the perpendicular distance, if you can imagine that. It's shorter than any of those ones, right? So the perpendicular one's the shortest one, and the important aspect of that that we know is that being the shortest distance from these things, uh, let's see, how do I say this? Being the shortest distance from both of them, we know that this is the same relative distance that we're referring to. That I wasn't going from D to A right here, and some random point, the fact that they're both the shortest distances is important. Okay, with that in mind, this is known as the angular bisector theorem. A point that is on the angle bisector, uh, the bisector of an angle, is equidistant to both sides of the angle. So once again, we can set up an equation where I can say 8x plus 27 equals 4x plus 3. Those are the lengths of those segments. This is known as the angle bisector theorem. Without those right angles, this would not have been able to be utilized. The only way it could have is if we did some other sort of markings here that these were congruent or something, but we're good. Okay, we're going to go ahead and solve for x now the same way as before. I'm going to subtract 4x from both sides. I'm going to we'll see how this works i'm going to subtract 27 from both sides these equation things are right right subtract 27 both sides and i get negative 24 divide by 4 and you get x is negative 6. now being a teacher made thing maybe there was some oversight in the setup of this one but solving for x x is allowed to be negative but lengths shouldn't be negative so it's going to say solve for the length of ad if i do 8 times negative 6 plus 27, it looks like we're going to get a negative length. And we can double check that we get the same number here eventually. This is negative 48 plus 27, which is negative 21. So AD is negative 21. Now that shouldn't have happened, if that makes sense. Like we could change this problem. We could change these to minuses, for example, and then we get x equals 6. Maybe that's the way that we should do it. If x equals 6, then we get this different answer. And it would be an entirely different answer. It wouldn't be positive 21. But you shouldn't have negative lengths. Now, take that as a sign of if you were testing, there was probably more oversight on the exam being made so they could make sure that that mistake doesn't happen. So if you get a negative answer, not for x, but for your length, then maybe you did something wrong in those scenarios. I know I didn't do anything wrong in the problem algebraically, but that's the answer and we're just gonna live with it. So I hope that's okay. Now, if you ever do happen to change it to a minus, like minus and minus right here, then eight X minus 27 equals four X minus three. Then I could do the subtract four X. But now when I add 27 over, I'm gonna get that and I get X equals six. And then AD in this case would be eight times six plus 27. 48 plus 27 is 70. So you can see where there's a way different answer there. I'm just going to put that in just to do that. And if you substitute it in for CD, you would also get that 75. Oh, yeah, you'd get... Um, no, actually, no. In fact, you wouldn't. Um, oh, you know what? I take it back. Now this is a minus. Now this is a minus here. And you know what? It would be 21. It would be 21. I take that back. I forgot those were then minuses as a result. Okay, so sorry about that. So anyway, if you want to get positive 21, turn those to minuses. You're good to go. All right, let's keep moving forward. Uh, let's look at number three. And it has two parts here. I'm going to move myself over again, where we find the coordinates of the circumcenter of the triangle. Now, a circumcenter. A circumcenter, y'all, is made from the perpendicular bisectors, uh, the, the point of concurrency of your perpendicular bisectors of a triangle. Now, I'll explain it more as we get the drawing in to connect and make sense of that, but let's go ahead and plot these points. We got negative two, negative two for A, negative two, four for B, and six, four for C. Looks like it's going to be a right triangle, and there's more we get to speak on that. Three, four, five, six. We get to speak more on that as well within the problem as far as what kind of answer we expect to get and how we can really process this for ourselves. Because there's a lot of things you can do mathematically to find points, I would say, there are a lot of things uh, you can do visually to find points as well. If you recognize it's a right triangle, the circumcenter will appear on the triangle itself, not inside, not outside, but it'll be on the triangle. You gotta find perpendicular bisectors. Now, the a way that you can go about finding things such as midpoints, mathematically, algebraically rather, is like if I want to find the midpoint 
of segment AB. Let me label these. A is here, B and C. Midpoint of segment AB, for example, would be averaging your x values, negative 2, plus negative 2 divided by 2, and averaging your y values, negative 2 plus 4 divided by 2. Negative 2 plus negative 2 is negative 4. Negative 4 divided by 2 is negative 2. And negative 2 plus 4 is 2, and 2 divided by 2 is 1. So you'd get negative 2 comma 1 as that midpoint, which is right there. Now, the reason why I found a midpoint is because I'm trying to find the perpendicular bisector. A bisector would divide, would intersect at the midpoint, divide the segment into two congruent parts. And that was the long way of doing that. If you imagine there's a significantly shorter way to do this, especially when you have something like a vertical line right here, it's an easy count. The distance from A to B is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and halfway in between 6 is 3. So either 3 up from A or 3 down from B, you arrive at that midpoint, which is something that I generally preach to my students. But it depends on what you're expected to do or how complex the problem is. Or if it's like a fraction and decimal, you don't know what to do there. So let me draw this perpendicular bisector. What I did next here, and I'm not going to talk about slope for this problem yet, or at least this part, is that if I have a vertical line, perpendicular to a vertical is horizontal. So I do know that that's going to create a perpendicular bisector from that. Same reason why I knew this was a right triangle, because this is a vertical line with a horizontal line. But if you must know, a vertical line has an undefined slope, and a horizontal line has a slope of zero. Now, I did state that the perpendicular, excuse me, that the circumcenter is on your triangle. That means it's on one of the sides. And your point of concurrency of your circumcenter is somewhere on this line. So is the answer going to be here or here? Those are the only two points on the triangle for this line. We'll find out with another one. Let's go to BC. Let's go that short path this time and see if it's okay for a problem like this. If you want to do midpoint later, we can. We'll count this over 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. The distance from negative 2 to 6 is 8. Half that distance in between is 4, and 4 away from either point is at x equals 2. You can still average those x values, you know, negative 2 plus 6 is 4, divided by 2 is 2. But you don't have to average the y's, because what's the average of 4 and 4? Well, it's 4. And a vertical line is perpendicular to that of a horizontal line, so this is once again another perpendicular bisector of this. Now, circumcenter is the point of concurrency of all your perpendicular bisectors. Notice that I did not draw the third one. Um, I'll tend to not. I want to kind of save time for it. But if you must know the appearance of it, if you attempted to do so, it would be... Um, actually, I don't know. I'd have to... Maybe I'll talk about it later. But anyway, this, this right now is the point of concurrency of those two lines, which means the third point would also go through there. This is the midpoint of segment AC, and perpendicularly through that would go somewhere. But the point no pun intended, is that this is what we were looking for, the coordinates of the circumcenter of the triangle. And we found that this is at 2 comma 1. Now, if I were to speak further about this just shortly, and then I'll move on to part B, is that the reason the perpendicular bisectors... Um, well, actually, let me go one step further. The circumcenter, a circumcenter, is equidistant to the vertices of your triangle. That means if I drew a circle from this center right here outward, it would touch C, B, and A as vertices right there. And a circle has radii, which means all these lengths are equal. This length and this length and this length are the same. You don't need me to prove that from any other way after having drawn that circle. It is a perfect circle. This is a computer tool after all. So why does that work? Well, if you imagine, just look at this triangle right here that I'm kind of working out with the red that is the perpendicular bisector theorem. Remember, we know this is a perpendicular bisector because we constructed it. A perpendicular bisector has points equidistant, has a point anywhere on there that's equidistant to the endpoints of that segment. So these are the same length. And this one right here, this is another triangle where this is a perpendicular bisector. This point on it is equidistant to the endpoints of the segment. Because the points are concurrent, they're all going to be equidistant to those points of the segment. And the third one would have done the same thing, but we don't have to draw it. So that is the, uh, let me get rid of the circle. That is uh, number three, part A. Let's move on. We get to either go faster or slower, all depending on what kind of triangle it is. I hope for a non-right triangle this time, so we can look at something either inside or outside the circle. Let's look at points D, E, and F at 3, 5, 3, 1. At least that'll help. And 9, 5. Oh, well, it's going to be another right triangle, so. You live with what you get. Uh, okay, so with another right triangle, I think this time I'm going, going to be compelled to look at 
we know it's going to be on the hypotenuse. I because of the problem set, there's nothing I can do about it. But let's do one that's different so we know how to do it in case we must be different. I'll do one of the perpendicular I have to do one of the perpendicular bisectors, the vertical or horizontal, technically. Uh, but if you know that it's on the line itself, then you should also know that the midpoint of this guy will be the answer. Let's go and take a look at this a little more. Let's look at the midpoint of segment EF. I'm going to go for the hypotenuse this time of, once again, a right triangle. So the midpoint of segment EF, we're going to average 3 and 9. Halfway, and I could ask you what's halfway between 3 and 9. You might know that answer. And halfway between 1 and 5, for example. Average the y's. And that's going to be half of 12, which is 6, and half of 6, which is 3. So at 6, 3, we have this midpoint right here. I'm going to spoil it. Once again, this is the answer to the question. The orthocenter will be at, excuse me, orthocenter. Circumcenter will be at 6, 3, right there. Now, let's just go further with it and just talk about what we're going to do off this if you had to make something perpendicular to it, because this is the bisecting midpoint. Now, here, let's find the slope. This is a lowercase m the slope of segment EF. Now the calculated version of slope is a rise over run y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. I can do 5 minus 1 over 9 minus 3 to get 4 over 6 which is 2 thirds. Now with this slope of 2 thirds, that is this slope that you're seeing right here. If you want to find the perpendicular slope, you have to take the opposite reciprocal or negative reciprocal of the slope, which means take whatever sign it was and change it. If it was positive two thirds, make it negative. And the reciprocal means flip the two and the three to get three halves. This opposite reciprocal will get you the slope of a line perpendicular to this one. And we're going to draw a line through this point, given that slope. So negative three halves means you can go down three and right two down three and right two like so, or rise three and run two to the left like that. Rise three, run two. And that's where your line would be that is not only perpendicular, and but it's also bisecting, it, right? We already know it's bisecting by that midpoint that we already have. So I'm doing this one more so to let you know of what we probably got to do later. I'm sure with orthocenters, we're going to have to do something along altitudes because those are normally the kinds of problems you'll have for orthocenter. And this is a perpendicular bisector. So this guy's perpendicular to it and all that. Now, before I move forward with another one of these lines, and I'll go really fast on them, but before I do, let's look at this one again and see how we could have done it without calculating midpoints. And they, you kind of kill two birds with one stone in doing this. Check this out, I'm gonna draw this in purple. I'm gonna make these lengths here. Well, you know what, we have them right here. I'll just use these lengths right here. Boom, boom. How do I find the slope from E to F? It's not just Y2 minus Y, it's rise over run. You rise one, two, three, four. You run one, two, three, four, five, six. There's your four over six, that's what you're looking for. That's why, you know, with a graph, I would tend to do that with my students, for example. Um, look at the graph, count the numbers, work that out, write it as a fraction. You'd still have to reduce that fraction, do whatever it's there. But you really kill two birds with one stone, and here's why. If you recall these midpoints were halfway between these values, the midpoint was halfway between these. And again, we can do that for these ones here. Well, this midpoint is halfway between these, but it's half of its rise and it's half of its run. So if I get that slope, I can also use half of these numbers to get the midpoint. I can go instead of up four, I can go up two. Instead of going over six, I can go over one, two, three, and boom, I hit my midpoint there as well. So if you have the graph, and if it's clean numbers to work with, there's really another outlet that you have for that. Now, that being said, let's do all the points of concurrency here. Let's do all those perpendicular bisectors. Let's get this midpoint right here, half of six and half of four. Let's make those lines as well, the perpendicular bisectors, and see that they're all concurrent at that single circumcenter, which again is equidistant to the vertices of this triangle. And I, I really do wish that we had one that wasn't a right triangle, but um, we'll get what pops up. And uh, hopefully you got some work out of that anyway, especially with that diagonal there. All right, that is number three, finding the coordinates of the circumcenter. Let's now find coordinates of a centroid of a triangle. This is where I think I can do a little more speeding up when it feels appropriate. And then if you feel that you don't know how to do some of the math stuff with it, I'll calculate midpoints with you. And I, I think I already see how I'm going to do something like that. Now a centroid. 
A centroid is built off the medians of a triangle. It is the point of concurrency of those medians. Now, and I'll explain more on what a centroid does, especially if we have to do problems with them. I'm really seeking the, the median going into segment QR. As I eyeball it, it appears that this will be the midpoint, but I'm going to check for sure by doing what I did before. Let's count this slope, rise and run, or however you want to say that, from R to Q, and get that over here without calculating it. Let's count it. We rise 4, and we run. This is to the left, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, just like before. But this 4 over negative 6, which reduces to negative 2 thirds. Oh, you know what? My goal wasn't about the, the slope and opposite reciprocal. I should have actually said that. Anyway, let's forget what I just did about slope. Um, I forgot we're not doing a perpendicular bisector, but we are finding the midpoint. Half of 4 is 2, up 2. Half of 6 is 3. We're going left 3. So this will indeed be that midpoint from 4 to 6. Now, the importance of this is that a median is drawn from the vertex opposite that side to the midpoint. Of that side. So if I were to draw a median, it goes from P all the way up to the midpoint right there. Sorry for that snap. Let's go and fix that. That is one of our medians that we have without needing to really calculate anything. I kind of just counted it. Now the centroid is somewhere on here. Somewhere on here. Let's draw another median and figure out what it is. Now the only problem is the other midpoints, which I speculate are about here and here, are halfway or whatever between points. Let's maybe count a midpoint for sure. I can do all three if you want to and just really relate what a median's all about, especially since this one's already drawn. So right here, let's do the um, midpoint of segment QP. So let's get the average 0 and 3 and average uh, 8 and 0. And this is one of those ones that what's the distance, half the distance between 0 and 8 is 4, right? That's a little easier. Now, 3 over 2 is 1.5, and I'm going to use the decimal form of that just because of what we have to say out of it. 1.5 over and 4 up will get this midpoint right here, which means I can draw a median from R to there. And that's a median. And I've already now found my centroid. It's this point of intersection here. But let's find the third one. Let's find the midpoint of segment PR. And again, I'm guessing it's right there. So let's average 3 and 6. And let's average 0 and 4. Average of 0 and 4 is 2. Let's get the easy one out of the way. 3 plus 6 is 9. Half of 9 is 4 and a half. So 4 and a half comma 2 will be right there. From this vertex Q to that one opposite, boom, is right there. And you can see that once again, these medians are concurrent. So they are all concurrent at the single point. This is known as your centroid right there. That is the point 3 comma 4. And that'd be the answer. Now, a centroid is not a circumcenter. It's not an incenter. It's not an orthocenter, right? They're different things. A centroid being the intersection of the medians, you don't circumscribe or inscribe this triangle unless it's like equilateral. But this has a specific point where any median like this can be, uh, it's, it's spliced into certain fractions. This length from vertex to centroid is two thirds the distance of this entire median here. And from this vertex to this centroid, this is two thirds this entire distance right here. And then from this vertex to this guy, this is two thirds the entire distance. Now, that being said, there was a second way we could have done the centroid without drawing two medians. And that's what I want to show you next. And I'm probably going to do it for the next problem if it's easy enough. I'll erase these temporarily, or let, let me like hide them a little bit. Remember when. Remember when? Remember when we only had this median at the time? This was the only median. Because it was vertically drawn, this was very easy to count this distance. And this distance was from 0 to 6. So this distance here is 6. If you know what a centroid is, 2 thirds of the distance from the vertex to that centroid um, will be from the vertex to the centroid. So 2 thirds of 6 is 4. And if I count up from vertex 1, 2, 3, 4, I would have landed on that there centroid. So there are several ways you can do that, and I will use that for part B if there's an easy one to count, if there's a horizontal and vertical line that's really a good one to use it on. And you might want to use that principle because if you don't land on a centroid that is integers, 
you might be landing on some thirds fraction or something like that, and it's really hard to come up with what it is unless you start using algebra to solve it. So I'd rather use just two thirds of a number and write it that way. So we'll see what we get on part B. Let's get ready for this one. On part B, we have the point P at negative six comma nine, and then six comma one is Q, and then R is negative six, negative seven. Well, we might not be as lucky this time. We'll see. Is that negative six or negative seven? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Is this six now? One, two, three, four, five, six. The problem with these numbers is I can't tell what goes to what. I think I did that right. It's harder on this left side than the right side there. I'm gonna trust that that's correct for now. Uh, this is R. First, first test I gotta pass is being able to plot points on an xy axis. I, not everyone can do it. You should, you should be able to, and I am too. Okay, so, whoo, big triangle. We'll see about that median, one of the medians. I'm really hoping from Q to here, I'm really hoping that this Y equals one, this, this is a horizontal line that can go right there. And then we can get one of the talks in and maybe I'll do a second midpoint for you anyway, just to confirm we got the answer. Okay, so let's find the midpoint from P to R. Now let's do this the old fashioned way because it's vertical, count the distance or calculate it in a way this is nine and this is seven, right? So the total that's 16. Half of 16 is eight. So eight away from nine is this guy or eight away from negative seven is this guy right there. So yes, from Q to here, we will have a horizontal line median, which was really good for what I wanted to talk about regarding centroid. Okay, so this is one of your medians. Now the other ones we could get if we worked out midpoints, but check out what we could also do. Let's find out the distance, this distance, from Q to our new midpoint. Uh, let's call it um, M. So the distance from Q to M is from six to negative six, right? Which is 12. And don't call distance negative on this. Don't put a negative 12 there. Um, two thirds of 12, 12 divided by three is four times two is eight. So two thirds of 12 is eight. Or you can do one third, which is four, but two thirds of the way from the vertex to the centroid. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight is this right here. And again, one third away from the midpoint, it would be, but the theorem says two thirds, so I'm gonna go off the two thirds. So is eight right there. This is our centroid. The answer to this guy is gonna be negative two comma one. Now I didn't draw a second or third median, and I can. And I'll draw one more. Let's do it uh, midpoint of RQ. Midpoint of segment RQ, which is, where's R? Negative six plus six divided by two and one plus negative seven divided by two. Average these values. Negative six plus six is zero. Half of that is zero. And negative six over two is negative three. So this is the, this is another midpoint right here. And so therefore, this is another median right here. And look at it going through that centroid, which again, a two thirds distance, but this distance is harder to count. You have to use distance formula or Pythagorean theorem or something like that to make it happen. And I don't think we've gotten yet to calculating those things, but I'm going to do one through distance formula, one through Pythagorean theorem, show that they're the same thing if we have to get to them. That is number four, and I'm moving forward. Number five, let's find the coordinates of the ortho center of the triangle. Now in ortho center, and this is a toughie when it comes to obtuse angles if this is your first time looking at it. So let me just draw something else to make sense of it to begin with. Um, of course that would be obtuse if I do this as well. Hold on, I'm trying to come up. Okay, this is gonna be isosceles just temporarily. An ortho center is where you find the altitudes of your triangle and they are concurrent as well at the ortho center. So for example, this is a very easy altitude for me to draw given that it's isosceles. This is not about perpendicular bisector. An altitude is a right angle to the side opposite of vertex and the line goes through the vertex. So through the vertex to here, for example, would be an altitude. And this would be another altitude. I'm gonna eyeball it. I really gotta work my head in a certain way to get it. Just eyeball and pretend like that's it. So this is a right angle right here. 
notice that it's perpendicular to this but it doesn't bisect this segment no it goes through this this vertex so it's more like a median in the way of going from the vertex to the side opposite and of course if this was the other altitude here what you're seeing now is the orthocenter but much like perpendicular bisectors for circumcenters an orthocenter would be inside the triangle if your triangle is acute if it's a right triangle, it would be on the triangle, not on the hypotenuse, but the right angle. We'll see if we run into that maybe for this problem. I have no idea. And the obtuse triangle, it would lie outside of the triangle. And it's trickier for you to look at if you're not good with altitudes in this other way. Let me give you one more visual before I move forward, just with the sake of obtuse triangles and see if we can make sense of this. So in an obtuse triangle, notice that this would be one of your altitudes, for example, like this, pretend like that's uh perpendicular I don't think it looks perfect but I don't know if that looks maybe a little better so pretend like this is one of your altitudes right it goes from vertex and perpendicularly through that but how do I from this point to this line how do I make something perpendicular that's not a right angle you have to go outside of the triangle for it so you would ideally extend this side right this side would have to be extended Maybe not to the level of actually making it black like that, but if you extend that side, you can now see where that straight down goes for this thing. We're gonna be doing the same thing here. So this is an example of an altitude. Now, how can two altitudes like this intersect together? If you extend them far, um, further, further, if you extend them more like out down here and this one out that way, I still didn't get them, but they would meet out here. Your orthocenter would be this guy. And of course, this third guy would have an altitude out here. Now, what is that making a right angle with? It's making a right angle with this side right there. Notice how I'm extending that. And now this is a right angle. So this is what you're going to see on this next problem, 5A, an orthocenter outside of the triangle because it's obtuse. And you're going to see again something like that. I have to draw at least two of them. So I'm going to draw the easy one if I can, an altitude, well, I don't know what the easy one is, but you know, I'm going to do one of, yeah, I'm going to do the horizontal line one, and then we'll do the one through C in there, and we can talk about that. So that's an example of what you're going to see. Just get ready for that. Let's dive into our orthocenter problems. Try to get rid of these. I don't want you to start drawing things and going, I thought that was part of the problem. You promised it was part of the problem. I, I said no such thing. All right, find the orthocenter of these points that are already plotted. Let's go to work. I did already make mention of the fact that if you kind of get a side extended, such as this one right here, this BC, I can draw the altitude from A through BC's extended side. Notice that this is a vertical line. So the first thing I want to do is find the line that would be perpendicular, the slope, if you will that would be perpendicular. And perpendicular to a vertical is a horizontal line. So any of, like this, for example, is perpendicular to it. In fact, this would be the perpendicular bisector, but this is not what I want. I don't want the perpendicular bisector, I want an altitude. What's an altitude? It's gotta go through A. A, through A here, let's start it kind of on A. This is an altitude going to BC. And I didn't make mention of this a second ago, but for area of a triangle, you would have to do this kind of thing. If BC was your base, then this would be your height. This would be base and height. Height is always perpendicular to base, and base is always one of the sides of your triangles. So I was saying if that was base there. Let's do another one. Let's do the one, the altitude through C, which I imagine is going to look like that, but let's see how we actually get that. Remember, it is through C and perpendicular to AB. Here's what you first got to do. You got to find the slope of segment AB. The slope is your, and this is why it's good to have these numbers here, y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, looks like it's kind of the same number twice here, minus x1, six plus one is seven over seven, which is one. You could have also checked that out right here, either counted up seven over seven, or kind of seen that this is an up one over one slope. Now that's the slope of this, like we did with perpendicular bisectors, let's take its opposite reciprocal which is negative one. Remember, this is one over one, so flipping that fraction doesn't really change anything, and you also wanna know how a slope of one works, or negative one. If a slope of one is up one, right one, a uh, slope of negative one is down one, right one, or up one, left one. So if I wanted to truly draw altitude, I'd go up, left one, up, left one, like that. 
but I do have to go outside the triangle to meet it with this other thing. So you want to draw the line as best as possible, and I think you can see where this orthocenter is going to wind up like that. So here's the right angle, the altitude, but we extend outside of the triangle, and bam! We got an orthocenter right there, which has a 9, negative 1. Now, the circumcenter that we did before, you might be tested on those to do graphs with them, but there aren't many problems you can do with orthocenters because, you know, I did make mention that the circumcenter circumscribes a triangle, or you can draw a circle that does so. The centroid has the two thirds the distance thing. Orthocenter doesn't have those kind of math relationships and things like that. There are some things you could do with them that are more complex and we're not going to deal with them, and they involve needing to use other points of concurrency. But this itself is not some circumscribe this around this or this distance from here or these are equal distance, nothing like that. So like I said, these are the only kinds of problems you're probably going to do with an orthocenter unless you're using compass construction. But otherwise, be ready for the graph things and perpendicular bisector stuff is not, excuse me, not perpendicular. Um, perpendicular lines, opposite reciprocal slopes, getting altitudes are all about that. All right, let's plot D, E, F, and let's predict what kind of triangle or what kind of orthocenter we're going to have based on the triangle we have. So negative 2, 5 is D. Negative 4, negative 5 is F. I don't know why I skipped E. And 5, 1 is E. So let's connect those, and I think this is an acute triangle. We'll see. If it, if it is an acute triangle, the orthocenter will be inside of the triangle. This looks pretty acute to me. Uh, any of those look like right angles or obtuse? I don't think so. So I'm expecting something inside the triangle. And this one will test your ability. This, this one really is a good problem as far as testing your ability to find altitudes because none of them are vertical or horizontal lines. So for this, we have to do two different altitudes where we have to find slopes. Now, last time I did this calculating thing, and as I said, you can count, I'm going to do the count of them this time. The whole goal of counting, or of finding slopes, is to get opposite reciprocals. Which one do you want? I'm going to do DE. I mean, let's, let's just do one. The slope of segment DE is going to be, we got to go down one, two, three, four, right there, and right from negative two to five, oh, that's seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So negative four over seven is the slope of DE. It's opposite reciprocal slope. That's a perpendicular symbol I'm doing, by the way, in case you weren't sure what I was making. That's positive seven over four. So here's what I'm gonna do. Through DE and through, or through F, I'm gonna do that slope seven fourths, and that will be a right angle through DE, it'll be perpendicular. So from here, this point, let's go up seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and over one, two, three, four. Hoping that's also the orthocenter. I'm hoping that we don't get a uh, another thing. Let's do it one more time to like be sure on accuracy, especially if you had like a ruler when you're doing it, because I'm using a computer tool, and I'm going to change that line color. Don't worry. So remember, a perp this line does not bisect. It's not a perpendicular bisector. This is an altitude through F, through point F like that. Okay, so this is one of your altitudes. I'll go ahead and shrink it now. I just wanted to get it fully into that side there. That's one of our altitudes. Really hoping that this 0, 2 is going to be it. It looks like it could be. Let's do another one. Let's do the slope of segment EF now. Slope of segment EF count this this rise run kind of thing so we're going over one two three four five six seven eight nine and up one two three four five six so six over nine which is two-thirds we got to take the opposite reciprocal slope of this thing which is negative three halves so we got to go from D the vertex opposite that we're gonna go down three right two, looks like that's our orthocenter, down three, right two, and it's going to hit that point. So this guy, let me get my colors right, this guy will be through like that, that's an altitude. So without 
needing to calculate to draw the third altitude, you guys could understand. Like if I said, draw the third altitude that goes through here, you could understand that it should just be concurrent with that. So that would, I mean, instead of finding the uh, opposite reciprocal slope and stuff, just take E and just draw another line through there and boom, you have your third altitude right there. So if you did, if you were calculating it on your own and just checking answers with me, this would be your third one like that without me having calculated it. And then you have that. So your ortho center is at zero, two. It was inside the triangle because the triangle was acute. That's number five. Anything else? Nope. All right. We did not calculate in centers with graphs. You are unlikely to do that. Angle bisectors with slopes. I honestly, I don't even know if I know how to do that. And I haven't tried, but um, we are going to do other things with in centers. Now we spoke on circumcenters being the point of concurrency of your perpendicular bisectors of a triangle as it made sense with the perpendicular bisector theorem. Before we do the problems on here, let's make sense of an in center. It is the point of concurrency of your angle bisectors. It tells you that this is an in center. So they didn't tell you these are angle bisectors. Not that you need to know that now, unless you don't know what an in center is equidistant to. So let's talk about that. Remember the angle bisector theorem that we did on page one, where I might have screwed up, I not I screwed up, but the likes were negative and I wanted to turn them positive for you. K, would be an example of a point on this angle bisector and this angle bisector and this angle bisector. Well, what we know about the angle bisector theorem is it's equidistant to points that are on the sides of your angle. So such as this angle right here, remember we talked about shortest distance with the perpendicular lines. That means these two lengths are the same here. Just ignore the rest of the thing here. Just for this triangle, these are the same distance away. For this triangle, for this angle I should say, these are the same distance away. And for this angle right here, these are the same distance away. The point is, all of these are equidistant to these sides. And if we do the perpendicular line shortest sides, then you could also inscribe a circle at those points G, H, and I. Now, I don't know if this is drawn to scale, so I'm going to try this for the sake of this problem to see if it actually works. Let's draw a circle to, oh, that was not what I wanted to do. That looks fun though, right? Let's try this one. Eh, maybe, maybe not. But this is the idea, right? This a circle can be inscribed inside the triangle with K at your center. The point is the distances to the sides, those perpendicular ones, are the same. It's good to mark those. They said solve for X. We have length 7X minus 31 and 3X plus 17. We can set them equal to each other. 7X minus 31 equals 3X. 17. Once again, that is because GK or G, uh, GK equals HK. Let's subtract 3x from both sides, add 31 to both sides, divide both sides by 4, you get oh, 12, like that. Now they said solve for KI. KI is the same length as both HK and GK. Pardon me. So KI. You can take either expression. I'm going to take this one. It's the same as GK, which is 3 times 12 plus 17. 36 plus 17 is 53. No units are labeled here. This is 53, like that. 53, I, that's a bad 5. Which means all the others should be 53. You might want to do the double check 7 times 12. 84 minus 31 is 53. Okay, now this, let's see if this is part of the same drawing. I think so, because it says part C. So if measure of angle F is 50 degrees, and when they say F, they're probably talking about the whole thing, like HFI. So if that's 50 degrees, which means it's bisected to 25 and 25. And if measure of angle KDI is 20, probably degrees, let's see where that is. KDI. KDI is right here, it says so that's 20. Let's find the measure of angle HEG. HEG is right here. This is our unknown. So what are we going to do with this? Well, a couple things. Let's look at the big triangle. Let's look at this guy right here. 
the interior angle sum of any triangle is 180 degrees. If you add all the angles up, the measure of the angles up in the triangle, you get 180. We know one of the angles in the triangle is 50. And we know that one of the bisected angles, given that it's an in-center, that's important. One of the bisected angles, half of it is 20. So, you know, the whole thing is 40, right? The measure of, I'll just call it measure of angle D. Measure, um, well, here they were particular with HEG. So the measure of angle GDI, measure of angle GDI is twice that of the measure of angle KDI, which is twice 20, which is 40 degrees. I, I know you could write that on your own, you know, the way you're able to. So the whole thing is 40. And now we have two angles of the three, which should add to 180. So measure of angle HEG plus those uh, the 40 degree angle and the 50 degree angle equals 180. Those add to 90. And if you subtract 90 from 180, you get 90 degrees. Now it's not drawn to scale, but this wasn't drawn to scale to begin with. Right, so this doesn't look like a right angle to me. Uh, it wasn't drawn to scale to begin with. You notice when I tried to draw that circle, it wasn't completely inscribed. But if they say that it is, then we go off the information. We don't go off the drawing. And I think that's a very important thing to remember. So that's the measure of angle HEG. That is part C for number six. Let's go to number seven. Let's kind of lighten this stuff a little more so it doesn't look so in the way. Let M O n be the mid segments of triangle j k l find the measure of segment k l you know what i haven't done at all recently was i haven't been saying what section things are from the circumcenter so you in center like the circumcenter are out of six three and the orthocenter and centroid questions would have been out of six four a mid segment question i believe is out of six five six five so M, O, and N are mid-segments. A mid-segment is a segment drawn from the midpoints of sides. So that would mean these are the same, these are the same, and these are the same. Because M, O, and N are at midpoints, they are, these segments are bisecting the sides, things like that. Do we need to use that information? Maybe. But what does a mid-segment do? Let's look at one mid-segment at a time as I just draw them. This mid-segment is not only parallel to this segment JL, they, I literally drew like horizontal lines so it kind of looks it. It's not only parallel, but this length is half of this entire length. So if this is 49, the entire length of JL is double 49, which is 98. If they were asking that question, which they're not, then I would get that answer. NO is a mid segment from these two segments, KL and JL, but KJ opposite that side, this is parallel to this and 42, this is half this length here, which means this would be 40, uh, 84. Are they asking that? No, they're asking for KL. So let's go to this guy, MO and KL. They are parallel. Now the parallel part's not gonna be relevant to what we're doing on these problems, unless we used graph stuff, but it is half the length, or this is double the length. So the length of KL is double that of the length of MO. KL has the expression 13x minus 10. That is equal to double that of this 6x minus 1. Now we can use that to solve algebraically. So let's distribute the 2 here. Let's subtract 12x from both sides, add 10 to both sides. We get x equals 8. That's not what they asked for, though. They asked for KL. And KL is 13x minus 10. So KL, let's do 13 times 8 minus 10. 13 times 8, 104. You might want to double check that stuff with me. Uh, 94. If you if I miscalculated something, please use your own calculator and figure that out. I sometimes I just not that good at it. Um, that's really the only way. Listen, the 49 and 42. You might be asking, what were they used for? Uh, decoys, my friend. Uh, I use them to also explain and express what these lengths were in total. And uh, yeah, that's what they are. And also, you know, like with the 49, for example, I said it's half of this length. That also means these are both equally 49. So if you ever have to use something like that, you know, just be ready for it. But that is what mid-segments are and do and how we can play with them and all that. Let's move forward to number eight. 
this looks like a question out of what would be section 6-6 six, six, using the triangle inequality theorem. Determine if a triangle can have sides with the given lengths. Show work and explain your reason, reasoning. Magical yes, no answers will not be accept, accepted. Meaning don't coin flip, just say yes or no. Reason with that answer, tell us why. Um, without getting too philosophically deep into it, you might be able to make sense of this when we look at these ones themselves. Let's imagine that we had a side length of 12 right here. So 12 is one of these lengths. And a side length of 7, which would be more than half, what the heck? Which would be more than half of 12. So imagine that like this is like 7 right there. It's asking if you can make a triangle with a third side length that was 4. Now imagine that like this was 4 right here. Or it can't reach with that seven. It's not long enough. What makes it long? Because I didn't draw these to scale. I was giving an idea. But what would make it long enough or short enough? Well, seven and four, if you add them together, here's seven, here's four. If you add them straight together like that, seven and four, you would get 11. And the segment addition postulate, which is a thing, says if you have collinear segments, then they you can add their lengths to get the length of an entire thing like that. 11's not equal to 12. Hold on, I have an alarm going off. 11's not equal to 12. 11's not more than 12. It's not going to, they're not going to reach. That's when they're flat. When you have to bend them up, even slightly, when you have to bend them up, they're going to go farther away from each other. You saw me just kind of hinge this thing right here and go like, like that. The seven would be swinging outward more if you did that. So they're just not going to connect. Here's what you need to do. The triangle inequality theorem says that A plus B has to be greater than C. I, I wrote A. It has to be greater than C. The, the sum of two sides of your triangle must be greater than the third side of your triangle. This answer is no, because the two shorter sides, 7 and 4, are not greater than 12. 11 is not greater than 12. That's my justification. This is the triangle inequality theorem. Now, if this was an 8, it still wouldn't be enough. 8 plus 4 is still not greater than 12. They would only be able to connect flatly together. They would. They need to bend up in some way. 12.1 is acceptable. You can make a triangle, even a small one, or very obtuse. Uh, okay, given that a triangle has a side length of 13 and another at 36, what are the possible values of x? Okay, imagine that I had a side length 13 and 36, and 36 is significantly bigger than 13, so I'll kind of do it like that. So... 13 and 36, what can I make x be as a side length? I want you to imagine a couple of things with me here. That's kind of a right triangle looking, but that's not the point. x can be a certain smallest amount all the way up to a certain biggest amount and everything in between, or be within a range of values, and that's what we're trying to come up with. How small can x be? If I can make this, the angles from 13 to 36 as acute as possible, such as like that, I can really shrink x into something right here. Now, x would be considered one of the small sides. Maybe not the smallest, but 36 would be the largest in this case, right? Because of the way that it's bent inward, x is less than 36, if that makes sense. So there's a small case we have to consider where, using the triangle inequality theorem, x plus 13 still has to be greater than 36. Now, if I subtract 13 from both sides to solve the inequality, x would have to be greater than 23. If x is not greater than 23, you cannot make a triangle for the same reason you saw for 7, 4, and 12. That would have to be the case. Now, let's do this instead. Let's widen these to like a very obtuse angle. Say that this is your 13 like that, and your 36, you know, is out like that. So 13 and 36, suddenly, you're making 13 and 36 spread out a lot, so that x is your long side. So there's a one of the shorter two sides case, but there's a largest side case where now when you add 13 and 36, they must exceed x so you can still make a triangle out of it. So these are the two cases that you're setting up. You're using the triangle inequality theorem to, to create two different inequalities to find the small end for x and the large end for x. 13 plus 36, 49. 49 has to be greater than x. Another way of saying x has to be less than 49. So these are the two parameters we have to stay within. If I write it as a compound inequality, I would say that x has to be between 23 and 49, kind of write it in that fashion. And any number in between those, 30, 40, 45, 48, 
23.1, those are all fine. 23 is not okay, 20 is not okay, 50 is not okay. Has to be in between those and a triangle can be made. You can make that A plus B greater than C for any of the sides. X doesn't have to be the smallest side, it doesn't have to be the largest side, it just needs to be one of these lengths within. All right, there's number nine. Number 10, this is also from this section, list the sides of the triangle from smallest to largest. Now this is another, I forget what the name is called, uh, and I think that's okay, it's, it's called like triangle largest angle theorem or something like that, or longest side theorem. So it goes as simply as this, opposite the largest angle in a triangle is the largest side, opposite the smallest angle is the smallest side. Now I don't know what the largest and smallest angles are yet without knowing what angle Z is. We do know that the angles of a triangle add to 180. So if you add the measure of angle Z with the 82 and 54, we'll get 180. Let's combine those to 136 and subtract 136 from both sides and it looks like it's 44. So we get 44 degrees for Z. Looks like Z's angle is the smallest so if we ranked the angles in order, I know they want sides, but if we ranked the angles in order, angle Z would be the smallest. Angle X would be the next largest and angle Y would be the largest. Now, as far as sides, the one that they actually want, let's go off of those. Opposite angle Z is segment XY. That will be the smallest side opposite the smallest, the shortest side opposite the smallest angle. Opposite angle X, would be segment YZ, that is the middle side as far as length. And then last one is opposite angle Y, which is segment XZ, this would be the largest. This is the answer we need. Now, it, the same is true the other way. If we had side lengths, we could go opposite those sides to get angle measures. Opposite the shortest side is the smallest angle and opposite the longest side is the largest angle. You could do the same thing as these go hand in hand. But because this one was angle measures and we know the angle should add to 180 measure wise, we could have found that 44 on our own and we did. That is out of six, uh, section 6.6, six, I believe. Okay, I think this is the last page. I know that the back page ended on proofs. We have two more proofs. This would be ideally out of section 6.1. Let's see what uh, we know about, let's see what I know about this. Um, given M is the midpoint of segment AB, B is the midpoint of segment MD. I'd really love to put some markings on here and make that happen. M is the midpoint of AB. I'm going to mark those. B is the midpoint of MD. Now, I probably should be uh, writing. We'll see. I, I'm going to write some things as a result of this. Once I marked that up, and this, this is kind of what you want to do. Take your diagram, mark something up, and kind of wrote what you marked. M is the midpoint of AB. That's a given. Given that it's a given, <laughs> We can mark those congruent, and because they're congruent, we can state that they are congruent with one another. It looks like this is more of a math proof, though, so we're probably skipping the step that would say segment AM is congruent to segment MB and going straight to segment or the length of segment AM is equal to the length of segment MB. I believe you can probably you're probably allowed to mark that for midpoints. It doesn't just create congruent segments, it creates equidistance. That is by definition a midpoint. And there's a second one. You have to remember that the step one had two steps about midpoints, and this is the only one that's being reasoned with. So let's write the other one alongside it. If B is the midpoint of MD, that means that these two are congruent as well. Now because, because um, that one had a single tick mark, then I can do a single tick mark for that, and that's fair. So I can also say that MB is equal to BD for the same reason definition of midpoint. Um, we're going to continue further on with that. You couldn't straight up say M A M is con uh, equal to BD, even though it's marked as such, we'd have to document that step as another one. I think that's what we're about to do. Um, MD is equal to MB plus BD. MD, this length, is equal to these two lengths added together. I mentioned this before, this is known as the segment addition postulate. This is saying that if you have these collinear segments, and we know that they're segments because the way that they're written, that we can justify that. Now, where will they go with this? Our proof, and I know it's kind of pre-built, so I didn't talk about the end. Our proof is that the length of MD is twice the length, is two BMs, two BMs together. So what we're going to do here, I don't know yet, I'm gonna take a look. What we're gonna do here is use one of these statements here and justify through a substitution that one thing could equal another. Uh, how do I want to do this? Because MB equals BD, 
and we want to show that MD is two MBs. Notice that MD is already here and I have a single MB here. What if I made this an MB? Not by crossing it out, but what if BD just said MB? Well, if it did, then we uh, then we could justify that, right? By substitution, we could add some things together. So it doesn't honestly it doesn't look like we're using the AM part at all. I don't know if that's really needed. Like I don't think we need to. Know. This is kind of one of the things that you generally don't want to state things that are unnecessary. So I don't think this was needed. I don't think we needed this, and therefore that. But that's okay. Let's use this. The fact that MB and BD are equal. And let's replace BD with MB on this step, like that. What did I do? I substituted. This is known as the substitution property of equality. That one part of an equation was substituted by something that was known to be equal uh, within it. It's not the transitive property. That would have. To prove that AM was equal to BD would have been transitive property. Two segments equal to the segment, same segment are equal to each other. We'll see if the second proof uses transitive property. Now we're just simplifying. MB plus MB is 2MB. This is known as simplification, combining like terms. Simplification. It is not the addition. Simplification. It is not the addition property of equality. The addition property of equality would say that you add the same thing to both sides of an equation. We didn't. We did no such thing. That is not what this is. So uh, there's the proof. Um, it seemed a little janky when it came to the fact that this was there. I don't. Again, I don't think that was needed or used. So completely taking that out still satisfies this scenario. Just taking out that part of the diagram, and we have that in. So what did we actually prove? We proved that. The entire length of something that has a midpoint is twice just one of your lengths. That was our proof. Anyway, whether you take that out, leave it in is up to you. I just wanted to mention that generally we don't include things that are not needed. All right, last question. This is number 12, parallel lines cut by a transversal proof. Now, this is multiple different ones. And I'm going to say this straight up. Angles 1 and 2 are not alternate exterior angles. I just want to bring, if you know what alternate exterior angles are, which 3 and 2 are, by the way, 3 and 2 are alternate exterior angles, they require a transversal, and a transversal needs to intersect with the same, um, it needs to be the same line intersecting with two different lines. Angle 1 is made by these two lines, angle 2 is made by, by these two lines. They do not share a line. Angles 3 and 2, however, share a line. They share this line H. Uh, is that an H? Yeah, they share this line H right here. So I just wanted to mention that. I, I know that it's a conversation I've had with my students. Okay. Given line G is parallel to line H, it is marked. Given that these lines are parallel, also given that angle 1 is congruent to angle 2. I'm going to make it its own statement so I can um, talk about them separately and state how 1 is used somewhere. Now, it's not marked, so let's go ahead and mark that up. Angle 1 is congruent to angle 2. What we're going to try and do, we're going to prove that line P is parallel to line R. This is one where, since we're building the proof all on our own, let's talk about that end and see where we want to go with this. Clearly, relating angle 3 would be a very nice thing to do. Because once again, 1 and 2 are not alternate exterior angles. That's not something you can say. What you can do is find a way to relate 3 with 2 and 1. You know, I call that kind of stuff. That's what we're going to try and do. So to prove lines are parallel, you're going to use what's called a converse theorem. The Because 3 and 2, remember how I mentioned 3 and 2 are alternate exterior angles? Because these are alternate, I'm not saying they're congruent yet, but because 3 and 2 are alternate exterior angles, if they were congruent, that would mean the lines are parallel. That's the converse of the theorem. The original theorem says that parallel lines means alternate exterior angles are congruent. Now we're trying to say that because alternate exterior angles are congruent, lines are parallel. So what we're going to do is find a way to show that angle 3 is congruent to angle 2. And we do it by relating 1 with 3. And we can relate 1 with 3 because these lines are parallel. With these parallel lines here, I can say that angle 1 is congruent to angle 3 because they are corresponding angles. This is known as the corresponding angles theorem. Uh, if you hear someone say corresponding angles postulate, I'll say they're probably not wrong. I would also call it a postulate as well. But our textbook does prove this theorem, even though it's kind of a rough looking theorem based off other postulates. 
I called her Pasio back in the day. That's why I always have to excuse myself by saying that. Now, based on our markings, I think you can kind of make a conclusion that I stated here. Remember, single arc marks we put here, and we labeled a single arc mark there because they're the same. Here's what we're doing. Two angles congruent to the same angle. Angle two, three are both congruent to one. Because they're both congruent to one, that means two and three should be congruent to each other. Two angles congruent to the same angle are congruent to each other. If angle one's congruent to two and one's congruent to three, that means that angle two is congruent to angle three. This is an example of the transitive property. And this is not the transitive property of equality, but the transitive property of congruence. Okay, so we have the transitive property of congruence. And the last statement here, notice that two and three are alternate exterior angles. We also found them to be congruent, not because of parallel lines, not because the alternate exterior angles theorem, it's just that they are alternate exterior angles, and we found them to be congruent by other means. Therefore, if alternate exterior angles are congruent, then these two lines are parallel by the converse of the alternate exterior angles theorem. Line P is parallel to line R by the converse of of the alternate exterior angles theorem. And that is it. That is your proof. It is indisputable, undeniable. All right, guys. I think that's it. And that's it. So, as before, are you ready? Are you ready now? I sure hope you are. That ought to do it for this one. This is Mr. Robinson. Thank you so much for watching. Again, stay tuned for a chapter review out of the textbook from that problem set and a, the chapter test. All of them are kind of all reviews here on out as far as things that are cumulative to the chapter. We'll see how they ask different questions here. The two questions that they didn't really ask that I wish they did on this thing were regarding circumcenter. Having graphing, plotting a circumcenter on a graph that would have been not from a right triangle and using the circumcenter to find the points that are equidistant you know, from these by solving algebraically. Everything else kind of seemed to kind of be there. So I hope that helps. All right, guys, that's it. Thank you so much for watching. Went just over an hour, but take care. I will see you in the next one.